still in chapter 12 of Hebrews, and at the very beginning of this message, you may think that the introduction isn't related to the message, but it really is. So you have to bear with me a little while. Hebrews chapter 12, the subject is the chastening of God the Father in the lives of his children. And I'd like to read verses 3 through 17, and I'm going to skip to the 22nd verse and read through the 24th. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet withstood or resisted unto blood, agonizing against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. Quote, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, that is, or as it seemed good or meet to them, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, not all chastening for the present seemeth, to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord." looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, for ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he caught it, sought it carefully with tears. <coughs> Verse 22, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. There are only two kinds of people in the world, and since our world this morning is confined to the dimensions of this hall, there are only two kinds of people in this hall. Now, these two kinds of people are described in the scripture not as Jews and Gentiles, nor black or white, but they're described as saved and unsaved. They're described as the sons of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, or they're still the sons of Adam in Adam's sin and in his transgression and also in his death. We can't be in between. None of us are half saved. And none of, us, none of us are half lost. It is not that we are not lost until judgment. We are lost now if we are lost. Or if any man fails to receive and to believe the life which God has given any son, upon this man the wrath of God still abides. And abiding under the wrath of God, he's lost now. The saved are saved now. We're not awaiting judgment to decide whether we've made it through or not. There will be no weighing of our deeds to decide our eternal destiny. Destiny is in a person. It's in Jesus. And those who have Jesus are saved and they have his life. Those who have his life are as sure of heaven as though they had already been there 10,000 years. Well, at least as sure as he is of heaven. 
And he's very sure because he's already there. And he's seated at the right hand of God. And not so much that God seated him at his right hand for some purpose for himself, but the emphasis in the scripture to us who are here upon the earth is that God brought him to the heavenlies to seat him for our benefit. To show us once and forever that the work is finished and he has been accepted and we have been accepted in the beloved. So we, the saved, were lost. No tomorrows about it. Judgment is not a thing that's coming. Judgment is here. Judgment is already passed. The cross was the judgment of mankind. And we have either already eternally escaped that judgment by being placed in him who cannot ever be judged again, or we are yet outside of Christ and so lost. Lost now to God, to others, most of all to ourselves. Okay, so we have two different kinds of people. And in these two different kinds of people, because they are two different kinds of people, we have two diametrically opposed views of what life is all about. The Christian can never see life like the unsaved sees it. The unsaved can never see life like the Christian sees it. So the unsaved have invented words and used an entire vocabulary that is foreign to the believer. Here we are existing side by side, living on the same plane and perhaps in the same strata of society, moving, most of us, in the same circle, but seeing things entirely different, understanding life in an entirely different manner, and so living our lives in an entirely different way. Well, the simple reason for all of this is that those who are saved can see. They were blind and now they see. They see what the unsaved can't see. They understand what the unsaved cannot understand. And what's more important, they believe what the unsaved cannot believe. The unsaved deal with reality. That which they can get hold of and measure and feel, touch, hold. And they say there isn't anything beyond this reality, but the unsaved deal, or the saved deal, with a whole life of what the world would call unreal, unreality. Abstracts, the world would say. Principles, ideas, thoughts, and conceptions in our mind. But not so the believer really sees these things. They're not spiritual hallucinations. He has sight the world doesn't have. He has light the world doesn't know. He'd been brought out of the darkness in which he once lived and into which he was born. And now he walks in the light. And walking in the light, he actually sees what he has never seen before and understands what he's never understood before. And that's why we have two diametrically opposed views of life. Now, all religions from the beginning of time are in reality philosophies of life. And all religions and philosophies of life deal with the one supreme question that every thinking man comes against at some time in his life. And that is the question of what the mystery of life is all about. What the purpose of our existence upon the earth is supposed to mean. Someone said, our sweet mystery of life. It is a mystery that every philosopher has dedicated his life to understanding. Every religious teacher spends his life trying to explain to the people what he has discovered about the meaning of life. And with all of this teaching, with all of this speculation, there has come to us two distinct views of what life is all about. And it depends on who we are as to which view we have. Number one, there is the view of the, well, in Paul's day, I believe it was the uh, Epicureans who held this view, that the only reality in life was the reality of pleasure. It was pleasure derived from experience, not pleasure derived from reason, but from the experience of life. And so they had a little philosophy with something like eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. 
And they emphasize the great philosophical ideas that when death takes us, there is no more pleasure. And when death claims us, joy has had its completion. It's all over. Nobody laughs, they say, in the grave. No one can enjoy the pleasures of life when they're dead, which seems to be a, some kind of a true statement. But anyway, their entire philosophy about life was built upon the fact that we have today as a reality, and the only reality of this day is the pleasure from which we derive for ourselves the joy that we might glean from this day's experiences or the material benefits and wealth that might accrue to us from this day's efforts. And so they lived for the pleasures of their own flesh. And I believe that undoubtedly there are many people who have the same philosophy today. Slits beer people have it, incidentally. Life just comes around once. And so you must go after it with all the gusto you can muster up. That to them is a case of slits beer. <laughs> And I don't know anybody lives like in people in those commercials, do you? You know, hanging off the side of a sailboat or whatever it is they're doing. And this, this, is the, this is the philosophy of most of the people you know. What is there after life? There isn't anything. And therefore, we better just eat and we better just drink and do whatever it is that gives us pleasure and do whatever it is that gives us joy and do whatever it is that secures for us some amount of happiness, no matter how small or how great, because, you know, when we're dead, there'll be no opportunity. And since there's so many people who believe this, it always mystifies me how thinking people could ever cling to such an idea about life. Because even to a man who never read the Bible, just observed the ups and downs of life and the sorrows and the joys mingled, it would seem to me a pretty futile existence. <coughs> Jesus said it like this, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world? And if he should lose his soul? That is, if, if the Epicureans should happen to be wrong, if... The people of our time might have made some error in their calculations. And if after death comes, there is something else. And if there really is a God, and we should have gained the whole world but never came to know him, what would it profit us? All of success, as man measures success, is failure, if this be so. Well, I never knew anyone who could really say that the joy and the pleasure they've derived from life exceeds and outweighs the sorrow and the heartbreak of life. Even in the most sheltered kind of life, the sorrow and far outweighs the joy. The disappointments in life far outweigh the expectation and the enjoyment of life. What would be the point in continually being upon the potter's wheel of life if we couldn't look forward to a day when the vessel that has been made there finds some eternal function or some eternal enjoyment, would it be worth it all to be buffered by the awful abrasives of this life, to experience the sorrows and the heartbreak we're born into this world, to die? And from the very moment that we draw our first breath, if you'll allow me just to say it this way, we look forward to the day when we shall draw our last breath. And every even fleeting joy and every little speck of happiness is, is tinged with that sorrow. That it is here today, but it is gone tomorrow. And if you hold this kind of a philosophy about life or this kind of a view, you're going to be messed up one of these days because life will suddenly seem too futile, too much effort for so little derived. And he will become very, very disillusioned about life and become very, very embittered about life. And you'll begin to do as most older, unsaved people who have now suddenly seen the folly of their ways and find no other way to believe do. You wish for death and sometimes it doesn't come. And even if it comes, you're not sure that's what you really want. And if you hold this particular kind of philosophy you must end up sooner or later frustrated about the experiences of life because you can't fit them in to any particular pattern or any particular blueprint 
And you just don't know how yesterday works in with today, nor exactly how tomorrow is going to affect our now. But the Christian has a widely different view, an entirely different view, and a real precious view. This is the Christian view. He believes that man was born to know God. And he believes that his entire purpose upon this earth, not one of the purposes, but the most important, the only important purpose for which he exists is to know God as his Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'd like uh, to talk to you about this from the 17th chapter of Acts. And uh, whether you realize it or not, Paul was somewhat of a friendly philosopher. You know what a friendly philosopher is. He, he stooped to philosophy when he had to, but he had his own philosophy, and this philosophy was rooted and grounded in his knowledge of God. Now, I'd like for you to, to let me read and explain to you a little bit in the 17th, um, pardon me, in the 16th, no, I'm right, the 17th chapter of the book of Acts at verse 26 where Paul, at the seat of philosophy, at the very city of Athens itself, does battle with the philosophical giants of his time, and he expresses his views of life. They'd been giving theirs. No, no doubt the Epicurean teachers had been there, and they said, look, there isn't anything to life but pleasure. Have your fling. Do your thing. Eat and drink and be merry. Laugh while you can laugh. Why do you have some strength to do the things it takes strength to do? There'll be plenty of time to sit around and think. Live it up. Have yourself a time. Don't be guided by any other principle than this one guiding principle that has guided every philosopher who holds this view. Whatever gives me pleasure is right. Whatever gives me joy is right. Whatever ministers to my happiness is right, whether it's for the second, for the moment, for the hour or for the year. Have it today. Don't worry about tomorrow. There isn't any tomorrow. And I see Paul sitting there listening while they've expounded their philosophies and it sounds so inviting to the flesh. Because the flesh would love to live that way since he could throw off any kind of moral responsibility and he could just do whatever it is he desires to do without fearing any eternal consequence, without any day of reckoning, without any guidelines to which his life one day must measure. And so when Paul is finally given the floor, now he didn't come here to preach exactly, but he came to kind of take them unawares and to become all things to all men, and so he had to talk a little philosophical-like in order for them to listen to him, or else they'd have said, you're only preaching, you're a religious quack, get off the stand, we want to hear your philosophy about life. So he talks about life. And this is what he says. He says that God, the eternal God who exists in heaven, the God who is there, the real God, has made of one blood all nations of men, and he made them to take their permanent habitation or their dwelling place upon the surface of the earth, and he has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So here in his philosophical statement, Paul believed, and this is what he said he believed, that the eternal God had made us all, and so in a sense we become his offspring, as he tells them later. God has created us, and... He has created us to dwell upon the face of the earth. And in our natural state, there is no difference between any of us in His sight. And before we came upon this earth, before we existed, before we came by reason of natural birth, God did some arranging in our lives. Now you listen carefully to what He says. He determined... And this comes from, the, from a Greek root, which is the root of our word horizon. It's the word horizo. And it says that God set a horizon upon the times which he arranged ahead of time in our life. You with me? 
Before we were ever born, God determined the horizon of our times. And within the horizons of our times, he arranged beforehand certain boundaries or limitations. And then he placed us within those boundaries and within those limitations to face the prearranged times bounded by his horizon. Not as far as we can see, but as far as he can see. Okay? As they say out there in the world, it's kind of heavy. <laughs> you have to stay with me for a little while. What does it have to do with chasing? You'll see in a minute. Now, I don't like God meddling with my life. I don't like him sitting up there before I was ever born deciding how far I could go and how far I couldn't go. Do you? Oh, you don't like that unless you love God. If you love God, you're tickled to death about it. But the unsaved doesn't like it because it limits his liberty. Never had any liberty. Born the slaves of sin, the children of Satan, controlled by the spirit of disobedience, swept along in the course of the world like a leaf on a flood swollen river you didn't have any liberty to start with you just thought you did it seemed like you did because the devil told you you had liberty the only liberty you ever had was to move within the boundaries that had already been set upon your life and to move in to the prearranged experiences and times which God himself scheduled for you and whether I like it or whether you like it we have all been programmed. And I can't change the program, and you can't change the program. God himself programmed your life, and he programmed mine before we were born. Now, if you're unsaved and you accept that, you immediately become a fatalist. And so you say, what will be, will be. You know, why fight it? And this is precisely what I was before I was saved, a fatalist. I said, God made me what I am. If he wants me to be something else, he'll have to make me something else. If he made me a drunk, then I'll be a drunk. I'll be the happiest drunk in town. If he made me a thief, I'll be the best at my trade. After all, he created me, he made me, he arranged my times, he programmed me. I'm only living what he programmed in advance for me. Well, this isn't quite right. It isn't quite so. Because fatalism is blind. It doesn't really believe in the existence of God. And if it really did believe in the existence of God, it could never believe that God programmed us for sin and death. And this is precisely what Paul tells them, that this divine arrangement in your life was for your good and was the outflow of his love and his mercy and his kindness toward you. Because he arranged all of the prearranged appointments in life for this purpose. Number one, that you should inquire after the Lord. Number two, that you might feel after him. And the word in the Greek is that you might grope for him like a blind man gropes for a door. Somehow he knows it's there, but he can't get hold of it in the darkness, but he reaches forth for it. And number three, that you might find him. And number four, in finding him, you might discover that he is not far from every one of us. And in realizing, <laughs> after coming to find him, that he's not far from every one of us, then we realize that in him we live. All of our lives are in him. And in him we move. All of our movements are within the framework of him whom we have found. And in him we have our being. I don't know what that means. Sounds nice. We have our being. Our very existence itself is in Him. We are what we are in Him. 
We live in Him. We move in Him. Every day of our lives we sense that He is near to us. We have found Him. We groped after Him once in the darkness like a blind man reaches for a door he knows is there. And at last we have found Him. And in finding Him, we have found all. So that life now becomes no mystery. For the first time, it has meaning. It has reason. Behind it is a will. And behind all of that is God. Now that's the two philosophies of life. I like the last one better. I like it because it works. All right, what happens in the unsaved? Let me just elucidate a little bit. The unsaved is moved back and forth from one appointment to another in life, appointments which God himself arranged. And uh, I don't know whether this makes any sense or not, but when I was a little boy, I used to play the pinball machine, which was about the only sport there was during the Depression. It didn't require too much training. And I always marveled at how the ball always seemed to end up in the place the designer of that machine wanted it to end up. But that wasn't mere chance. The ball was uh, directed from one bumper to another. And so, bouncing off of each determined bumper, it ends up in its predetermined slot. And the unsaved are exactly like that. They're like a big giant ball in a pinball machine of life. And they bounce from one divine appointment to another and from one bumper to another, moved by forces they neither understand nor realize, and are brought to their own desired end, not particularly the desired end of the designer. Everything that happens in the life of the unsaved is allowed to happen that they might in turn inquire after God and inquiring after Him might feel for Him and in feeling for Him might find Him and in finding him, might discover the true purpose of the mystery of life. That all life moves in him. And all life has its being in him. And all life lives because of him. I don't know. Can I break it down into just little simple things? Like, uh, here's an unsaved man out here. Why does God allow him to be stricken suddenly and... In, in the midst of his health with, with sickness. Or well, that he might inquire after the Lord. But for the first time in his life, he might stare up at the ceiling and say, you know, I wonder if there's any God. Where am I really headed? What's life all about? That's where I started inquiring after the Lord on my back, looking straight up for nine weeks. And you can only look at the ceiling so long. And then you've counted all the bumps and there's nothing else to see, and you begin to wonder what life is all about. Why am I here and someone else is well? Why did that car have to strike me instead of someone else? Why well, know men much more wicked than I who don't have these experiences? Why am I here? What's life all about? How does it fit into the pattern of my life? What is life? That's inquiring after him. Because life can only be explained in him. What's the next step? To grope for him. There, in the midst of life's appointments, we become concerned about him. We become to inquire after him. And the first thing you know, we're reaching for him. Suddenly we sense that he's out there and we want to get hold of him. This is before we learn he has to get hold of us. And so we begin to reach for him. We begin to grope like a blind man in the darkness. We're saying, I know he's there. I know God's out there somewhere. And if I could lay my hands on him, then I'd have the secret of life. Now, these divine appointments are the mercies of God. I don't care whether you call them good or evil. I don't care whether you call it bad luck or good luck. But life moves in a directed course in the life of every man. 
And everything in the life of the unsaved is for the express purpose of bringing him to know God by Jesus Christ. And everything in the life of the Christian is for the express purpose of making him like the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we have come to know and love. Now, when we're saved, we become the children of God, and God becomes our Father. He doesn't say that He becomes our King, He says He becomes our Father. He doesn't become our master. He becomes our father. He doesn't become our employer for religious good. He becomes our father. This is the relationship that Jesus came to reveal to man. And this is the only relationship the Holy Spirit will establish in the heart of the saved. God becomes my father. Behold what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And the Greek adds, and beloved, we are. God is our Father. And the very first word we learn to say of a spiritual nature in our hearts is Abba. And Abba is not a correct translation of the word Father. It's a more enduring, uh, endearing and intimate term like Daddy would be to us. So the very first thing our heart cries out when we're saved is Father. What does that mean? You say, I never experienced that. Yes, you have. The Holy Spirit lives in you. The moment you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes to take up His indwelling presence in your heart. And the first evidence of His presence is that your heart no longer fears God Almighty. You do not shrink away from Him like a guilty thing surprised at the thought of God. You don't meditate upon this fierce, almighty judging God who one day is going to bring you into his presence and cast you into hell because of your sins and your iniquities. The first realization for the child of God is that his sins are gone. Forgiven because of Jesus, washed because of the precious blood of the Lamb, and that all relationship such as creature to creator has now been replaced by one glorious relationship of love of a son or a daughter to his father. And the heart turns toward him as a child would turn naturally and normally to his father. Now life has a purpose. God is my father. I have been born not over again as Nicodemus thought he should be, but born anew. The old man was not born again. The old man is the same as he was born. The flesh remains unchanged. But there is now a new nature. Peter says it is the nature of God himself. Born not the second time for the same old nature. For if we were born of the flesh the second time, we'd still be just what we were the first time. Now being born by the Word and by the Spirit of God, there is a new man. And I've been studying for two or three weeks the life of Simon Peter. And uh, you know his name, which he received from his father, his earthly father, was Simon. And he was always known as Simon. And Jesus called him Simon the first time he met him. He said, Simon, son of Jonas or son of John. That was his relationship in this world. That's the how he came into the human race. He was the son of John, the son of Jonas, and his name was Simon. And he said, Thou art Simon, but thou shalt be called Peter. Cephas, a stone. And then he was known in his Christian life as Simon Peter. But he was always Simon, and he was always Cephas. He was never altogether Simon again, and he was never altogether Peter, until that day when Jesus does away with Simon and leaves what he said he would make him, that stone. So when when I was saved, I received a new nature, a nature that loves God, a nature that desires Him, a nature that feels like He feels and thinks like He thinks and moves in the direction that He's moving. 
and having become conscious of his relationship to me as my father. Life now becomes a perfectly ordered, at least in theory, set of arrangements which he has made for me before the foundation of the world. Now what does this teach me? Now we're back to Hebrews 12. It teaches me, number one, that all things that take place in the Christian's life are a part of a thing which he calls chastisement or chastening. Now that doesn't mean punishment, but it means child training, child education. It means that since he has assumed the responsibilities of fatherhood over me, born into his spiritual family as not a man, but as a what? Not even a child, a baby, an infant. Born into his family as a, as a baby, an infant. He assuming all responsibility over me as a father and having all power committed to him, then everything that takes place in my life I can receive from him as a part of a necessary training and education in my spiritual life. That's what chastisement is all about. Do you understand that? You have to because you won't understand life unless you do. And if you accept this and understand it, it will bring a tremendous amount of rest into your life concerning the affairs of your life. Born into this world, child. Where do we start out as babies? Well, in the nursery. And we're in the nursery. In my father's house are many mansions. And they're occupied by men. But as for a moment, I'm a child. And so I'm in the nursery. And so I'm constantly being trained and constantly being taught and constantly being educated and constantly being corrected, rebuked when necessary, scourged when necessary, but every day of my life is taken up with the good hand of my Father upon me. And wherever I am, and whatever He has allowed, He uses for my good and my profit, and to the glory of Himself in properly preparing me for his own house. You ever see a training ship in the Navy? Well, I was thinking that it seemed to me ever since I've been a Christian, I've been on training ship. <laughs> and they're always at sea, and they're always going someplace, but they never get anywhere. Because the purpose is not to arrive, the purpose is to train the crew. And all of the Christian life is precisely like that. We're being trained. It seems to us we're not getting any place, and that's true, but we're in training. And we're being educated. We're being made more like the Lord Jesus Christ every day of our lives, in spite of the fact that it seems to me, and it seems to you, that the opposite is true. Now, if God, if God uses everything in my life, and if He allows everything in my life, and if His hand is behind everything in my life for my good and for my profit, and for his eternal glory, then it makes trifles, trifles in life to be totally dignified. And it also has a tendency to lessen the proportions of what the world calls tragedies. You with me? Okay. You're not going to Mount Sinai, incidentally. God is not training us to live under the law. That's the purpose of this exhortation in Hebrews 12. We are not headed for the mount where there is thunder and lightning and flashing forth, forth of his holiness in judgment. We're not headed for tables of stone that we must keep the rest of eternity. We are already, his sons, already a part of that heavenly company, that innumerable company of angels and the general assembly of the firstborn, and we are on our way to Mount Zion, which Paul calls the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. 
This is our destiny, and we are going to meet the judge of all, and we're going to have fellowship with the just men, now made perfect, and we're going to stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus, who is the mediator of the covenant, which by the power of his blood has brought us to this place. And since we're on our way to this place, this heavenly city, this holy abode, the very presence of God the Father, then this life has a purpose. And the purpose of this life is to get us ready for that place. Now that's as simple as I can make it. That tells me then that all things in my life have a purpose, and they have a will, and they have a plan. And it tells me that my life, listen carefully, is not made up of a string of unrelated happenings. You believe that? It means that my life is not directed by blind fate. Lux doesn't preside over it. Chance doesn't direct it. It tells me that my life is carefully planned and arranged and allowed regardless of the instruments that are used to educate and to train and to perfect, to mature and to make me like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm reasoning with you this morning. Are you with me? Okay, then the next time you say, I don't like this thing in my life, just don't say that. Because what you're talking about is something which he has allowed. Don't, don't dislike the circumstances of your life and, and blame it on them. Don't blame it on men and circumstances and causes. Don't look upon your life and say it's all chaos. Don't do, as I've said so many times, it's just a bunch of jumbled pieces. Remember that even Peter, speaking about the sufferings of the Christian life, said that it was very necessary that they come into our lives. For he understood what Paul is writing. Chastening, listen to me, is of the Lord. Child training comes from him. And in everything in our lives, Paul says, give what? Thanks. In all things, give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning Jesus Christ for you. Next time somebody says, I wish I knew what the will of God is in my life, you can tell them, do you know? What is it? The will of God in your life is that you might give thanks for all things in your life. But there's some things you don't like. Give thanks for them anyway. The fact that you do not understand them and have made a wrong evaluation of them doesn't change the nature of their goodness. It tells me that this chastisement, this education, this training, this direction in my life is from the Lord. Remember, he said to those who had gone sick and tired in their minds and who had despised the chastening of the Lord, he said to them, you have forgotten. You have forgotten what life is all about. Chastening, he said, is of the Lord. That means it doesn't come from the devil. It means it doesn't come from men. It means it doesn't come from the powers that be around us. It means that whatever he is pleased to allow in my life, he is also using to educate, train, and mature me as a believer. Do you really believe that? Well, if you don't, you despise life. And in despising life, you will despise him who arranged it. The times and the events of my life were arranged by him. There is messengers. And I better be hearing what he's saying to me. And I best not despise his messengers, lest I despise the one who sent them. Chastening, he said, listen to this, and it blessed my heart early this morning, is 
of the Lord. I want to think about Jesus being the Lord there for just a minute. You don't like what's in your life right now. I doubt it seriously. Well, I don't know who. How can I tell? How many would there be this morning if we could have a testimony meeting and each one of us get up and uh, give your own reaction or your own evaluation or your own uh, like or dislike of the events of your life as they are right now this morning? I wonder how many there would be who would stand up and have the audacity to tell such a barefaced lie and say, I am perfectly content with every detail of my life just as it is. As far as I'm concerned, nothing needs ever change. Who will say that? Well, now, you have to say it by faith if you say it. I've said it many times by faith. Everything is just like it ought to be. But my mind never tells me that. My mind always says, I know it's generally like it needs to be, but I could make a little improvement if he'd give me a free hand. None of us are happy, totally, perfectly contented with our lives as they are. But here is where you must think that this chastening comes from the Lord. Think about Jesus. You don't like your life? Think about him for just a moment before he left the glory. When the joy of being in the Father's bosom and receiving the praise of the sons of God in enjoying the pleasure of all his creation in his undisturbed contentment of eternal life see him now at the council table of God agreeing to leave it all sacrifice it all Lay it all down in order to come into this life that he might bring you to God his Father. Now you think about that. In other words, you think about him before the foundation of the world was ever laid. Sitting at the council table of God planning in advance your eternal good. Now don't blame him in a moment of unbelief by accusing him of messing up on the details for today. Think of him when he came into this world and lived in this life. He came to seek one thing, the will of his Father, which was to bring you to himself like himself. Hasten on through his life until you come to Gethsemane and try to stay awake. The disciples didn't do it, but maybe you can. While you listen to him pray, and then you read the 17th chapter of John and hear what he prayed for. First of all, he made it plain to the Father that he did not desire that we be taken out of this world. He did beg the Father on ground of his own person that God would keep all that belonged to him, keep him from the evil one, Keep them from the deception of Satan. Keep them in that place of fellowship and bring them ultimately to his own presence. Listen to him plead in Gethsemane in prayer for you. It's one of the chapters, one of the places in the Bible where I find my name. A lot of it's very impersonal, but that chapter is very personal. For when he finished praying, he said, I'm not simply praying for those who have already believed on me, but he said, I'm praying for those who will afterward believe on me through their word. And I'm one of those who afterward believed on him through the word of these men who gathered with him at Gethsemane. He prayed for me. Do you ever think of Jesus praying for you? Okay. Then you think of him as he went to the cross and, and witness again as he hung upon the cross and marvel at the fact that he is upon that cross for you. He left the glory for this purpose to die in your place. He gathered up all your sins and bore them all in his own body when he took the cup. And at the moment of his death, God made him to be the sin that you are. 
and banished him in the outer darkness and sent him to hell and plunged him beneath the fiery waves of an eternal wrath that he might raise him from the dead as the eternal proof that God has made you his very special and eternal concern. Now, when you get that kind of perspective, you quit accusing him of messing up the petty details of your life. And if you need some more places to look again at Jesus, like we were told in the first two verses, then come to the upper room when the disciples were doing exactly what we do so much of the time. They were sitting there with their heads between their knees, bemoaning the fact that their world had gone to pieces and they couldn't put it back together again and somehow they couldn't fit Jesus into the middle of all of it. And he suddenly showed up in their midst, not because they invited him, but because they needed him. He came not because they sent for him, but because he was never far from them at any moment and because the shepherd was always standing in the midst of the sheep, though they knew it not. And he came in that upper room when the doors and windows were bolted for fear of the Jews, another sign of their awful unbelief. And he just suddenly appeared and he said, Look, what are you worried about? Peace. Peace be unto you. And then it says, and then were the disciples, the Greek says, were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Not when they saw his person, not when they saw his body, not when they saw that he was alive from the dead, but when they saw that in his hands were the eternal evidences of his love and that their lives for the moment were just exactly like he allowed them to be. And if you want some more, then come along with me and come into the very presence of God today and see him where he is this very moment while we're down here at Parkersburg, West Virginia, on the banks of the Ohio River. He is now at the right hand of the throne of God, seated, sharing equally the throne of the universe. Now listen carefully. All power in heaven and earth has been committed to the hand of the Son, directing and holding all things together by the power of His person, See him sitting there in our behalf, not as the ruler of the universe, but as the high priest over the house of God. And he lives and exists in that place of power and authority this morning for one reason, and that's to intercede for me, to intervene in my life, to direct the programming of my life, and to see that every detail of my life is used to correct, rebuke, educate, train, and mature me, <laughs> that I might soon be brought into his presence without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing and presented to him as his spotless bride. And then I had a happy thought along this line. Think of him in that moment when he comes for us. Well, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, John, uh, Paul says we should, we should be caught up. And there's so many things that are going to happen in that moment, that twinkling of an eye. Number one, John says we will see him as he really is. We shall see ourselves as we really are. That doesn't mean we're going to be all broken up over it. We're going to see ourselves as he has always seen us. As we really are. And in that same moment, that same twinkling of an eye, all of the unreasonableness of your life is going to become the sweet reasonableness of the will of God. And we're going to understand in a moment the twinkling of an eye what he now understands by what we say is an awful messed up series of events and circumstances. We're going to see the divine thread of his wisdom, his will, his purpose, and the intent of his goodness in each of our lives. Now, think with the, on this one thing. 
We always talk about the rapture when Jesus comes and he's going to shout and we're going to be caught up in the air to be with him. And the emphasis is always on the fact that someday we must face him in that face-to-face -face interview in the air. Did you ever think that at that moment he also must face me? What I mean by that? Don't you think that he must also think about that? What do you mean? I'm his bride. I, I know I must face him, and I must give an account to him of my life, and if you'll let me say this without committing any blasphemy, he must also face me and give some accounting of my life as he allowed it. And do you think he will do that with sorrow? He will do it with the utmost joy. He's going to say, just stand still for a minute, dummy. And we'll start back about 1925. And I'm going to tell you some things and show you some things and explain some things. And every little tiny piece will fit. And when he puts it all together, what do you think we're going to say? Nothing. Nothing. Because for the first time, we're going to be spiritually speechless. Oh, the marvel of it all. The wonder of it all. The grace of it all. Why, well, Lord, even those bad things were good. Lord, even those evil things were... Oh, he said, you were the one who said they were evil, not me. I told you all things work together for your good. It was your idea that some of them were evil and had somehow escaped my notice. I must face him? That's fine. He must face me. And then he will explain why when the Father rebuked me, it was only in love, never in anger, never in wrath, never as punishment, but only for my correction and only for my good. And this tells me, if I can accept it now this morning, that all things do indeed work good to them that love God and are the called according to His purpose, and that they do work for our profit. And where does this fit all the pain and the sorrow and the tears and the heartbreak well, they're the product of our unbelief generally, and they're the result of our calamity in being born a man. They belong to man. We say, well, if God arranges everything, how are we going to see good out of the heartbreak? And how are we going to see good out of the tears? And how are we going to see good out of all the sorrow, even in those things? Which are very natural exercise to a man in trouble. God has been working His eternal good, making eternal impressions upon us through our tears and our sorrow, and working eternal good while even now upon the earth through our tears and our sorrow. Lena laid this on my desk this morning. It's the bottom off of last week's calendar. I forget which day. David wrote most of the Psalms. Some of them are Psalms of tribulation. Some of them are Psalms of praise or jubilation and some of them are psalms of inspiration and it says here that if David's psalms would never have been sung if David's heart had not been wrung and about his psalms of jubilation it says David's psalms had never been sung if David's heart had never been strung and about his psalms of inspiration, it says, David's psalms had ne'er been sung had David's God ne'er touched his tongue. <laughs> and I thought this morning of the Lord Jesus, who was the man of the greatest sorrow ever, who shed more tears than all of us together will ever shed because he shed all the tears all of us together will ever shed. A man who came to be acquainted with our sorrow and with our grief 
And the scripture declares that all his sorrow and all his suffering and all his pain and all his tears, though they were the result of the hardships of life, and though the hardships of life were perfecting him through the suffering, and though he responded like a man under trial and under affliction, yet even in the sorrow and the tears, God worked an eternal good for us because I see Jesus now able, qualified, at the right hand of God to understand me when I cry. Do you think a tear trickles down my cheek he doesn't see? More than that, do you think a tear leaves my eye he doesn't feel? He wept it before I did. And the Old Testament writer says that God is so minutely interested in the tears that flow from my eyes and are brought from the heartbreak of my heart that he has stored them all up in a bottle. And I know he has at least a 10-gallon bottle for me. And he's saved every single tear. Now, what he's going to do with them, I don't know. There's going to be some eternal memento, I'm sure. But he's kept those tears. He's, he's, he's noticed every single one of them, and he understands every single one of them, because Jesus is touched by the feelings of my weaknesses. In my weaknesses, when I just can't muster up the spirituality to say everything in my life is just exactly the way he's ordered it, and the tears begin to flow, and I'm weeping because I'm disappointed in the way things are, and because I'm frustrated that I can't make any reason out of them all, and because I'm not for the moment willing to be subject to such a change of circumstances in my life, and I'm angered because he didn't let me approve it before he did it, and I sit down in the midst of my unbelief and begin to sorrow and begin to weep and begin to feel the very real pain that comes because of it, Jesus understands. He doesn't just look down from some superior place and say, in a patronizing way, there, there, Sonny, I understand about it. It is that this feeling, which is now being poured out of my heart, touches him. He was qualified and prepared for this work by his own sorrows and his own tears, and there is an eternal afterward we're going to reap through our sorrows and through our tears and see that even they in themselves and in their place worked an eternal good at the hand of our Father. But what are we to do then? First of all, Remember that it is all to make us partakers of His holiness. To be like Jesus is the end of the way. To be made like Him is the destiny of the born again. Not to be Him, but to be enough like Him that number one, He will find eternal pleasure in us. Number two, we will find capacity to eternally enjoy Him. And one of the greatest ambitions of my heart, suddenly freed from every inhibition to love Him. As my soul now witnesses, I really desire to love Him. I've never loved Him like I want to. Neither of you. But we shall. There's a little verse in the book of Revelation it first seems a little self-righteous and then it's so comforting. Jesus said, For they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Not worthy because we did anything or not worthy because we were anything or not worthy because we've accomplished something, not worthy because we've earned something, worthy because he finally, through the trials and tribulations of life, and in a moment the twinkling of an eye made us worthy. To walk with him without shrinking from his presence, with guilty conscience, with defiled heart, but to walk with him, to look right into his eyes, right into his face, to feel no shame, no guilt, no fear. Does that make sense? That's why the trials of life are taking place now in us. 
us, to wean us from his world, and to get us ready for him. As we might know him through the fellowship of his sufferings, we might be made conformable unto his death. On Wednesday night, I'm going to talk to you about the difference in our response to the chasing of God. Don't despise it. Don't faint under it by overreacting. Don't look down your nose at it, but endure it. Be subject to it. Receive it with thanksgiving, knowing that everything is indeed in His own hands. Then you will have the proper reverence for God, our Father. And the Scripture says you will live. You know what that means? It means you will enter into the real meaning of life. You will begin to enjoy life. When it looks like everything's coming unglued, you can sit down and say it isn't. It just seems that way. When it seems like everything's falling apart, you can say it isn't. It just seems that way. It's my perspective that makes me feel that way. His perspective is that it is all for my good and for his glory. And it's only hastening me toward that day when I shall be made like him. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your love and kindness in making us to understand the mysteries of life and to know that the mystery of life can only be solved in the, in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being our Father. And we're going to start confessing our sin now because there's going to be so much of this confession that will have to be made. Oh, how much we've judged you and second-guessed you and blamed you and criticized you. How we've murmured against you like the children of Israel in the wilderness. How we've blamed you for the unhappiness in our lives. Yet you've told us over and over and over, just trust me. If you don't understand, trust. Trust me. I love you. Calvary is the proof of it. Help us to hear our Savior pray for us again. Die for us again. Help us to realize that He longs for our perfection more than we shall ever long for. That He would not allow us to endure a single moment of grief or sorrow if it did not work some eternal good. Help us to realize that even in our tears and in our heartbreak, He's making divine impressions upon us. Help us to realize that one day in the presence of the Lord Jesus, we shall be sorry that we fail to trust you so much. We shall be sorry that we ever murmured against thee. And we shall see the perfection of our lives as you've arranged it for your own glory and for our good. Thank you now for this hour, for those who have come, for whatever you've done in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you.